Revelation and the chapter number 21, please. Revelation and the chapter number 21. If the boys in the sound desk want a title for my message tonight, it's this. Why people miss heaven. Why people miss heaven. Revelation chapter 21, please. And the speaker is the Apostle John, and he says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let's just seek God's face with his word open before us this evening. Father, we rejoice tonight in thy mercy and in thy goodness to us. And we thank you even in the, another extension to the day of grace, another Lord's Day when we have the opportunity to proclaim Christ who was crucified and rose again to save the souls of men and women. And Father, we pray tonight that as we preach the gospel message from this portion of Scripture that we've read together, that the Spirit of God would enable and that the Spirit of God would speak and that precious souls would come and put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, these opening verses of Revelation chapter 21 paint a wonderful picture of heaven and what it's going to be like. However, this eighth verse that we've read brings before us the sad reality that not everyone, not everyone's going to make it there. Heaven, the hymn writer got it right when he said, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Look at the second half of Verse 3 there it says, And God himself shall be with them and be their God. You know, to me, that's the greatest thing about heaven. There's lots of reasons to look forward to going to heaven. Perhaps there's, there's folks that we want to be reunited with, or perhaps we want to see the wonderful golden street of heaven. But you know, the best thing of all is God is there. Christ is there. Oh, what a day that will be. When my Jesus, I shall see. And then, of course, not only we think about the things that are going to be in heaven, but we can think tonight about the things that are absent in heaven. Look there at verse number 4. It says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are past Away. We have a world here described where all of the sorrows and sufferings of this life for once and for all will be eradicated. No tears. No death. No sorrow. No crying. No pain. These former things are passed away. The little gospel piece 
called Glory Land says this, the lame will walk in Glory Land, the blind up there will see, the deaf in Glory Land will hear, the dumb will talk to me. Oh, what a place heaven is. Think of the reunion. Think of the reunions in heaven of those who we've loved long ago, those who have parted from us. The hymn writer said, friends will be there. I have loved long ago. Joy like a river around me will flow. Yet just a smile from the Savior I know will through the ages be glory for me. I wonder tonight, are you headed to heaven? Is that your prospect tonight? Are you headed to heaven? Can you write, read your titles clear tonight to a mansion in the sky? Is that where you're headed after your death? Because verse 8 here brings before us this reality that not everyone is going to make it to heaven. It tells us that the fearful, the unbelievable, the unbelieving, the abominable murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Not only does it, verse 8 bring before us the reality that some people miss heaven, but it shows us the reasons why. It shows us the reasons why people miss heaven. Look, look over there to verse number 27 of chapter 21. It says there, and there shall in no wise enter into it, that is heaven, anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Nothing that defileth shall enter in. You see, God is holy tonight. And heaven, as, as God's Abode is a place of holiness. There's no sin in heaven tonight. That's another thing that's absent there. That's why there's no death, because the wages of sin is death. And if there's no sin in heaven, then there's no death in heaven. And nothing that defines will ever enter into that place. No sinner who's unrepentant and unwashed will ever enter into that place for it's a holy place. If, if sin entered heaven, it wouldn't be heaven anymore. God is of pure eyes and canst not look on iniquity. He will not suffer sin to enter into that place. Verse 8 brings before us a list of defiling sins that stop people getting into heaven. Let's look at this verse 8 in detail now. But fearful and unbelievable, unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let's leave out the first couple of things there, the fearful and the unbelieving, and let's look at these abominable sins. That word abominable, that's a word, I suppose, of summary. Because of all of the sins that are listed after it, they're all abominations. If we were to do a word study tonight in the word abomination, you would find that it goes against murder. You would find that it goes against sexual impurity. You would find that it goes against lying. You would find that it goes against all the sins that you can think of. Because every sin that you can think of tonight, it's abominable in the eyes of a holy God. The problem we have tonight is we're guilty of committing them. When we measure ourselves up against the holy law of God, we have to confess tonight that we have committed these sins. You see, the Word of God is like a mirror. When you get up in the morning and you, you have a look at yourself in the mirror and you straighten yourself up before you go out to your work, you're just having a wee look to see what you're like. And you know, the Bible is a spiritual mirror. The Bible just shows us what we're like spiritually. And as we read the, the, the laws of God and the commandments of God in the Bible, we have to conclude that, that we have trampled over them. We just need to take one of them tonight. It says, all liars, all liars shall end up in this lake of fire. 
and the hands up who hasn't told a lie. Every one of us. We have all sinned, and we have all come short of the glory of God. And in our sinnership, we are not fit. We are not fit to enter heaven. You know the problem with Ulster tonight? Ulster's full of people that are self-righteous. And they think they're good enough for God's heaven. And they think because they do their best that they are somehow deserving of a place in God's heaven. But God's heaven is not going to allow in anything that defileth. No liars. And you say, well, I'm not a liar. I might have told the odd lie here and there, but I'm not a liar. If you've told one lie, one, you're a liar. It doesn't matter on the quantity. It doesn't matter about the motivation. It doesn't matter anything about those things. All that matters is this, that you have broken the law of God that says thou shalt not bear false witness. These six things doth the Lord hate, yes, seven are abomination unto him. And what is in the list? A lying tongue. God hates sin. And he must and he will punish sin. That's why he has created this place which burneth with fire and with brimstone. But the good news tonight is this, that a God of love and a God of mercy is not willing that any should perish. And he's not willing that any of us should ever find ourselves in this awful place called hell. And so he has made a way that we can avoid it. He has made a way that we can be saved. And didn't we sing peace after peace tonight about it? About the cross. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, we find a picture of the cross here, even in this chapter that we've read together tonight. Verse number 21. Look at that one. It says, And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. This is speaking about the gates into heaven, the gates into the holy city of God. And there's a picture here of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, first of all, we should be glad tonight <clears throat> that heaven has a gate that heaven has a door, that there's a way that we can enter in. God could have just made the walls of heaven without doors. God could have made the walls <coughs> of heaven without gates. But he chose to make it in a way that men and women and boys and girls could enter in. The Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is that gate. He is the way. He said of himself in John 10, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He said further in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You see, he is the way. He is the gate. And we need to understand that because secondly, the Lord Jesus, in order to obtain access for us into heaven, had to die an atoning death on the cross of Calvary. And you know, the perils in these gates... The perils in these gates speak to us tonight of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the pearl is unlike all of the other gemstones. It's made of flesh. All of the other gemstones, whether it's diamonds or sapphires or rubies, they're formed in the rocks of the ground. But the pearl is born in flesh. The pearl is made in the oyster. And Christ became flesh. He became a man. He was, he was born into this world so that he could be our Savior. You know, the pearl itself is made when some foreign body penetrates the oyster, causing it great discomfort and pain. And the oyster then forms the pearl around that offending, that offending visitor in order to obtain relief. And we could say of the pearl that it is beauty, beauty born out of adversity. And we could say the same thing of the cross and of the plan of salvation, because the most beautiful gift imaginable the most precious gift imaginable has been born out of great adversity. 
It has been born out of great suffering and great pain. For the Lord Jesus Christ had to hang in agony on the cross of Calvary in order to deal with your sin and with mine. He bore our sins in his own body on that tree. That's what the cross was all about, you know. It was all about the Lord Jesus Christ being the substitute for the sinner, taking the sinner's place, taking the sinner's sin, taking the sinner's punishment, taking the sinner's hell so that they could go free, so that they could enter this wonderful place called heaven. You know, these gates of pearl, of course, like all gates and like all doors, they're hung. You talk about hanging a gate or hanging a door. And the Savior hung. He hung between heaven and earth. Oh, as you consider the price that the Savior paid for your sin tonight, can I quote a verse from, Jer or sorry, from Lamentations? Jeremiah, who, who, who penned it, said, Is it nothing to you all, all ye that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. And we could say that of Christ. He was afflicted in the great anger of God because he was taking the wrath of God. The wrath of God that was my due upon the Lamb was laid. Oh, how the Father afflicted him as he bore the wrath for sin. There's another detail I want you to notice about these gates. There's 12 of them. 12 of them. Twelve in the Scriptures is a number of completion. It's a, it's a number of perfection. And the work of Christ on the, on the cross was a perfect work. It was a completed work. It was a work that never needed to be repeated. That's why Christ cried out that word in the Greek language, teletestai, it is finished. See, there's nothing for us to do to obtain our salvation as if we could do anything. Christ has done it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. One final lesson. Look at verse 13. Something else we learn about these gates into heaven. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. You know what that tells me tonight? That tells me that the Savior is equally available to everyone tonight. Doesn't matter who you are tonight. Doesn't matter where you've come from. Doesn't matter if you're from the far-flung corners of the world. Doesn't matter if you're Protestant, Catholic, learned, illiterate, rich or poor. Doesn't matter who you are tonight. Christ is accessible. He's accessible to you. In John 14, the Lord Jesus said these words. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And it's been well said that heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. The question is tonight, have you prepared to meet your God? Have you? Have you prepared to meet your God? So how do we prepare? Well, we have to repent from these sins, these sins that we've been thinking about that are so offensive to God. We have to repent. That means turn away from. Aye, but there's another side to repentance. There's a turning from something, but there's a turning to something. And we need to turn to Christ. We need to turn by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. Because He is the only one. He's the only one who can save us. He's the only one that took our sins and his, on our sorrows and made them His very own. He is the only one who died on the cross for sin. There's thousands upon thousands of people who were slain on Roman crosses, but only one of them ever took the sins of humanity, and that was Christ. And there was only one who ever rose again. Rose again the third day. And he stands tonight, a prince and a savior, at the right hand of God. And he's willing and he's able and he's ready to save all that come unto God by him. You see, we need to believe. We need to trust. We need to put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that brings us back to the problem at the beginning of verse 8. It says, but the fearful and the unbelieving. 
Let's just read verse 8 and leave out the abominations. But the fearful and the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You see, in the final analysis, in the final analysis, it is unbelief. It is unbelief that damns the soul. Provision has been made for all manner of lawbreaking and all manner of sin, but nothing can be done for the one who is unbelieving. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You know, I see two types of unbelief here in verse 8. There's intellectual unbelief, and there's willful unbelief. And I'm going to work backwards here. Intellectual unbelief first. These are the people who refuse to believe that the Bible is true. And there's people like that. People like that in this world. There's maybe people like that that you know. There's maybe people like that sitting in my hearing tonight. You know, some people don't believe that there's a God in heaven at all. They don't believe there's a heaven. They don't believe there's a hell. People who believe the words of the song of John Lennon. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell beneath us, above us only sky. There's people who believe that. Maybe you're one of them tonight. Well, the unbelieving will perish. Then there's some, and they do, they do accept that God is real, and they, they do accept that, that, that Christ was his son, and, and they accept to a certain extent that the Bible is his word, but they don't believe in the exclusive message of the gospel that Christ is the only way. They believe that there's many ways to God, and many, many religions are, are viable and reasonable, and, and it's all different pathways, but it'll all lead us to the same God. We hear that a lot in the 21st century society that we live in. Pluralism and multiculturalism have flooded our land, and, and we have to now accept all of these different religions that are all round about us. But the Christian message is an exclusive message. And we've already quoted the words of Christ tonight, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. It's an exclusive message. Then some people think it's just too easy. This, this repent of your sin and trust in Christ, it's all too easy. Surely I have to do something. Surely there's something for me to do. Surely I have to, and like, like old Naaman years ago, he wouldn't just dip in the river. It was too easy. He, he wanted to go and do some great conquest, some great thing. It's too simple for him. Too straightforward. And for that reason, they won't believe. Whatever the reason is, they just won't accept the message of the gospel is true. They just will not believe. And they'll perish. They'll perish. Whether they believe it or not. However, there's another category of unbelief which it's much worse. And consequently, it comes first in the list of those who miss heaven. And this frightens me. This frightens me. It says, but the fearful. These are the people who are afraid to believe. These are the ones who know that the gospel message is true. They know it. They know it inside out. They could possibly stand up here behind this platform and tell you all about it. But they've never believed. They believe that the Bible is God's word. They believe that God created the world. They believe that Jesus is God's Son. They believe that Jesus died for sinners. They believe that He rose the third day. They believe that He's coming back to claim His own. They believe that if they don't believe, they'll even perish. 
They believe it all up here. But they've never believed in Jesus Christ. They've never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Why? Why? Well, there's many reasons why people will refuse to trust in Christ, but it's because of fear of one kind or another. Some are fearful of what their friends will think. Some are fearful to go into the workplace on a Monday morning and say to the boys in the factory or the boys on the fishing boat or the boys that they work with at the tractors or at the lorries or wherever it might be, they're afraid to go and tell them that they got saved last night. They'd maybe even love to get saved. But fear has a grip of them. The Bible says the fear of man bringeth a snare. Then there's others, and they're fearful that it will damage their prospects, maybe their career. Maybe they work in some field of business, and uh, they know that if they're going to be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to have to play with a straight bat from now on. And that few pounds that maybe the tax man didn't know about, well, that's going to have to be declared in the future. And maybe they're not going to have to, uh, maybe they'll not be able to climb the greasy pole the way they used to and trample over people as if they were dirt. They'll know that those things aren't acceptable anymore. And, and they're afraid because they quite like their career and they quite like the money that it brings them. And they're afraid to let it all go. Then there's others, and they're fearful to give up some pet sin. Oh, there's some sin that they have, some wee sin, and they just love it. They just like it so much, and they, they don't want to give it up. And they know that if they come to Christ, that they have to repent of it. They have to turn away from it. And it's got a grip of them. And they're afraid to let it go. Maybe they're fearful of persecution. We live in a day... And in an age when it looks as if the child of God is in for more and more persecution. We watched in our television screens this week about the appeal for the Asher's Bakery case. The people of God are under scrutiny now. The people of God, it looks like they're going to be up before the courts from time to time. And maybe they just, they just think it's all going the wrong way and I don't want to be part of this crowd when it all goes the wrong way. Whatever it is tonight, whatever fear is holding you back, you need to think about the big picture. Because there's something more, there's something greater that should cause you to fear. Matthew 10, 28 says this, the Lord Jesus speaking. He says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him, that's God, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Maybe you're one of those folks and you know the gospel inside out. You've sat in this here meeting house many a Sunday night you could quote the verses of Scripture. You know it all. You know it's true. But some fear or other is holding you back. Look at the big picture tonight. Look at the big picture tonight and fear Him. Fear God, the one that is able to destroy both soul and body. And hello, don't perish amongst the fearful. And spend eternity in hell a hell for which Christ died to keep you out of. Trust him tonight for his name's sake. May the Lord write his word upon our hearts. We're going to sing.